Hi everyone, greetings again from Ganubi Baptist Church. Wonderful to be together again. No matter where you may be watching from in the world, welcome to you. Great to have you with us and I trust that God's word is going to be a wonderful source of encouragement to all of us today, no matter what circumstances or situations we might be facing. Thank you so much to those who've made um, connection with me there via the comment section, letting me know who you are, where you're watching from. I really value those comments and feedback and it's just wonderful to know that God's word is going out via technology and making a difference in people's lives. So thank you for that. Well, today we're in part five of our Jesus Christ, the original series, and we're looking at the parable of the sower, sometimes referred to as the parable of the soils. I can tell you now, as a pastor of a local church, I really feel the weight of responsibility in bringing God's word to people week after week. Um, I spend hours thinking and praying and studying and preparing to make sure that I can give um, you of my very best. And you can ask my family by Saturday lunchtime, I'm so dialed into what I'm doing on Sunday that I begin to switch off from everything else. You'll really see me out on a Saturday night and if I, if I am with you, I'm there, but I'm not quite there, if you know what I mean. My mind is honed into what God has in store for us on the weekend. But this parable is not really about the pastor or about the preacher. It's about the listener. It's a parable about the condition of our hearts as we hear God's word week after week. And uh, how much thought, how much time... Do we give as listeners, in a sense, uh, to prepare the soil of our hearts before we arrive on a Sunday to hear God's word, or before we log on to YouTube to press the play button? Are our hearts prepared and ready to receive from God? Now, of course, we know that Jesus often spoke in parables. Uh, roughly a third of his teaching was in the form of parables. And uh, a parable can be described as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus illustrated powerful spiritual truth, um, just using examples from everyday life that people were familiar with. In this case, he tells them an agricultural uh, parable, a farming parable that no doubt they all would have easily understood. So let's turn in God's word to the Gospel of Mark Mark chapter 4, and let's read from verse 1. Mark chapter 4 and verse 1. And again he began to teach them by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in, on, uh, in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. So you've got the picture, Jesus on a boat, almost using the boat as a pulpit. And he's teaching and preaching the crowds on the shore. Then he taught them many things by parables. And he said to, to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty and some a hundred. Then he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what a beautiful short story, um, as I said, illustrating vital spiritual truth. The picture is of a sower, of a farmer, uh, he's got a bag of seed under his arm, he's walking through his field and he's throwing seed out and that seed's going off in different directions. 
Now, we're not given much information in the Bible about the sower. Uh, and there's good reason for that. They're not the main part of the story. Uh, sowers are not meant to be drawing attention to themselves. Um, they're simply meant to be sowing seed. And we have the strange idea in modern church culture that we need somehow the sower to be cool, um, to draw people to the building. Let's dress him in a pair of jeans, preferably with some holes <laughs> in them. Um, give him a cool t-shirt, um, design a cool product around the sower, and that should draw people to the building. Well, friends, as you read the Bible and as you look at the ministry of Jesus, um, you will see that crowds were no indication of spiritual success. Get your mind around that statement. Crowds were no indication of spiritual success. Within a few short days, the same crowds that were lining the streets of Jerusalem shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, because he didn't meet the expectations of a savior. Crowds are notoriously fickle and seldom a sign of spiritual success, as we'll see in this parable. So the sower sows the seed, and the sower, of course, doesn't draw attention to themselves. The seed, of course, in the parable represents the Word of God. That much is clear. The seed, the Word of God, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, in modern day church culture, there are those who say, well, let's make the seed more palatable. Let's make the seed more motivational. Um, I've spoken recently about the danger of deconstruction, deconstructing, dismantling historical truth uh, in order to be relevant. Well, friends, the moment you corrupt the seed, you lose the power. Corrupt the seed, lose the power, because the power is in the seed. The power is in God's word, not your philosophy or your opinion. And that's why Paul writes in Romans 1 verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed. No matter what you may think of me, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Yes, it may be a simple message delivered by simple messengers, but it's backed by the power of God. So we have the sower, that's each of us who love and follow Jesus. We have the seed, which is the word of God. Now let's get to the heart of the parable by considering each of the four soils, which of course represent the condition of our hearts as we are exposed to God's word. The first soil I've labeled the hard soil. We find that in verse 4. As you were scattering the seed, some fell along the path. Your Bible might use the word wayside. And the birds came and ate it up. There'd always be birds, uh, often a flock of birds following the sower, looking for seed that would fall onto the hard footpaths, the walkways, the pathways, um, in the fields where the farmers had, had walked. And I know that we experience the same thing here in the Eastern Cape when we're fishing for shad, in particular in the winter months. There are always birds um, around looking for a snack of leftover sardine. And in fact, one of my fishing partners recently actually had the misfortune of catching a seagull. Um, such was the seagull's interest in his piece of pilchard bait. <laughs> so this sower would have had a flock of birds uh, on his back looking for some seed that fell on the wayside. But the hard soil represents a heart that is rock hard spiritually, a rock hard spiritual heart. These are people who are just not interested. Um, they hear the message, but they're cynical, they're skeptical, they're critical, and they choose not to believe it. They choose to dismiss the message. And the more they do that, the harder their heart becomes. And Pharaoh in the book of Exodus is a classic example that readily comes to mind. Pharaoh saw miracle after miracle. Pharaoh saw the power of God on display on multiple occasions. 
And yet over and over again, we read Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. In the Old Testament, the phrase that was used was (laughs) stiff-necked. A stiff-necked people. In other words, people who are stubborn, who are obstinate, who just refuse to change their minds. People who refused, despite all the evidence around them, to allow God's truth to penetrate their hearts. Do you maybe know someone like that? Someone might say, yes, I'm married to one. (laughs) I have friends or family that are like that, and I've prayed for them for years, and I've shared Jesus with them, and there's been no or zero response, just hard, hard ground. Well, friends, the danger is that you give up on that person. Uh, They'll never change. They're too far gone. They're too stubborn. They're too proud. And I want to say to you today, never underestimate the ability of God to soften hard hearts. My first day of tertiary studies, I remember I was studying uh, marketing and, and advertising and management And I was wearing my famous hoodie, um, Jesus Christ, the original, uh, written boldly on the front of the hoodie. And the lecture room was packed, being the first day of lectures. And the lecturer, for whatever reason, stood up and to the whole lecture theater said, no one could be silly enough to follow Jesus, surely not in this day and age. And I realized on day one, man, this man's heart was hard. He was skeptical and cynical. But you know what, friends, over the course of three years, I built a relationship with this man. I prayed for him. I befriended him. I encouraged him. I tried to live a life of example for him. And roughly a decade later, give or take 10 years, I was preaching at a little church uh, in our city. And as I preached, I noticed a man with with tears just streaming down his cheeks as he listened to me. And I recognized the man to be my marketing lecturer. Afterwards, he came and hugged me and he said, Mark, today I also love and follow Jesus. Friends, never underestimate the ability of God to soften hard hearts. Don't give up on people. But secondly, let's look at the rocky soil. We find that there in verse 5. So some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had, importantly, they had no root. So these are people who hear the word. And there's a quick emotional response to the word. But you know what? That response does not last. Why is that? Because Jesus clearly says they have no depth. They have no spiritual root system. They're in church for six weeks on the trot. And then suddenly they disappear from the radar. And I've seen many, many people like this over the years. And it's this impulsive enthusiasm that retailers rely on. You know, those chocolates on the way to the tills, um, those impulsive purchases. Um, Taking out gym contracts would be another classic example. For two months, you're in the gym, you're exercising, you're training, but it doesn't last. And soon you're back on the pies and the Coke. Impulsivity. And Jesus says for this group, The problem is when the first sign of trouble, of hardship, of persecution arrives, they quickly fall away. We didn't sign up for this. Uh, We were told that if we follow Jesus, we'd be healthy, wealthy and successful. We'd be winners. And things haven't worked out that way for me. So count me out. And Jesus says in verse 21, Since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. You know, I remember attending a missions conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And outside the entrance to our hotel uh, was a huge tree. I remember a massive, massive tree. 
And that night a storm of mega proportions like only Brazil can produce arrived. And friends, I experienced wind like, like I'd never experienced before. And my, th my first thought was, oh my goodness, the tree, the tree's going to fall on top of the hotel. In the morning, I went outside to check. And guess what? The tree was still standing tall. It hadn't moved an inch. And the reason was the roots ran deep. That tree was so firmly anchored in the ground that no storm could move it. You know, if you were to ask me, how do you know, Mark, that your faith is genuine? Well, one of the reasons I would give you is that over many years now following Jesus, I've weathered countless storms in my life. And friends, nothing has moved me. The roots of my life are firmly embedded in Jesus. In John chapter 6, uh, you may know the story, Jesus feeds the 5,000, that great miracle of provision, the bread and the fish multiply, 5,000 plus people are fed. And the Bible says the crowds of people then continue to follow Jesus. He then takes a moment to get deeper with them, with them and he starts talking prophetically about his death. And about the fact that those who follow him will need to count the cost and identify with his death. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be straightforward being a Christian. Well, how do you think the crowds responded? John 6 verse 66. Listen to this. From this time, many turned back and no longer followed him. We didn't sign up for this, Jesus we were enjoying the miracles, especially the free lunch. But we didn't sign up for hardship, opposition or persecution. So in verse 67, Jesus turns to his closest friends, to his disciples. And he asks them, do you also want to leave me? Do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Friends, more than fickle emotion, the Christian life is about the test of time, consistently showing up even when you don't feel like it, week after week, month after month, year after year, putting yourself in a position to learn, to grow, to progress in your relationship with God. So soil number three, we're moving along quickly is called the thorny soil. We find that in verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. So we call this um, the crowded heart or the divided heart. In this heart, there's a mixture of healthy plants and unhealthy weeds. Uh, but eventually over time, the unhealthy weeds choke the life out of the plant and the plant dies. Friends, beware, beware the danger of a divided heart. The story is told of a young couple and the time came when the young man wanted to propose to the young lady. And so he said, I may not have a yacht like Johnny Brown. I may not have a mansion like Johnny Brown, but I love you. Well, the young lady responded, I love you too. But tell me more about Johnny Brown. <laughs> she was living with a divided heart. Well, look at the explanation Jesus gives in verse 22 for this group of people. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word of God, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, making it unfruitful. So we're talking here about believers. They've heard the word of God. They've responded to the word of God, but they've never really made a break with the world. There's always competition going on in their hearts between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world, uh, between two value systems, between two worldviews. And so if these weeds, if this divided heart sticks around for long enough, Friends, those weeds will eventually choke the life, um, will choke the truth out of your life 
and you'll find yourself walking away from Jesus. And again, sadly, I've seen many of these people over the years. There's, there's an example in the New Testament of a man called Demas. In fact, Demas was a ministry partner with the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine that? He started out so well. And then we read these tragic words in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10. Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and gone off to Thessalonica, living with a divided heart. Well, what about the deceitfulness of riches that Jesus mentions? Why can riches be deceitful? Well, they can be, uh, be deceitful because they make promises that they cannot keep. You know, before I studied theology, as I mentioned, I studied marketing and advertising. And the whole idea behind successful marketing or advertising um, is to make people, uh, make people feel dissatisfied with the previous product they purchased. You want the new, the better, the, the improved version that is now available. And so you get the new one and for a while you're totally satisfied until the next new one becomes available. And so the cycle of dissatisfaction continues. Listen to these words in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Are you listening, friends? For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You know, someone once said the problem with wealth is not in having it but how we got it, how we guard it, and how we give it. And I praise God for kingdom-minded people who generously, who sacrificially give to the work of God, who, who give to missions, who give to the poor, using their resources for the glory of God. Yes, they've got money, but money hasn't got them. Well, finally, we have the fourth category of soil, which is the good soil. Verse 8. Other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. These are people who hear the word, they receive the word, and that word produces a harvest in their lives. And friends, that harvest is exponential. One seed can produce as much as a hundredfold. Exponential power in those seeds. You know, I think about my own family. Um, my grandmother was a, a wonderful Christian by the name of Phyllis. And my grand sowed kingdom seed into her two daughters, one of whom is my mother, Lynn. Uh, Lynn then sowed seed into my dad's life. And he's got on to sow seed into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other lives. Mom and dad then sowed kingdom seed into the lives of their four children, Haley, Karen, Cindy and myself. We've in turn sowed kingdom seed into the lives of others, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of others. Uh, we've sowed kingdom seed into the lives of our children, who are in turn now sowing seed into the lives of others. And so the momentum continues. Can you see the exponential potential and power of kingdom seed? You know, it's so easy to get discouraged by the 75% that don't produce. But there's enough potential in that 25%, in that one seed out of four, to change the world. Jesus took 12 ordinary, unlikely men. And over three years, he sowed kingdom seed into their lives. And the book of Acts tells us they turned the world upside down. This is the power and potential of kingdom seed. Imagine what God can do with our lives in this generation as we come before him with hungry, open and receptive hearts. Friends, may God 
seal this word in your hearts. May you go on this week to sow amazing kingdom seed. And may that seed produce a harvest for the glory of Jesus. God bless and we'll see you soon.